Greetings, good masters. I am Maester Barnaby, and this is a study and lecture series on the House Tremaine after the ascent of the Lord Aster. After the unpleasantries of the Shower of Silver, the Tremaines return to their ancient and run-down familial keep of Famine's Hold, located in the Crownlands. But they do so with company. The Lord Defen Valerian is with them. Lords Bastion and Felion Will have made overtures that they shall soon be by about business, horse business, as the tourney season is far from over and a good courser can carry a mediocre knight in a series of passes, or a skilled one to the finals. Maester Horace, a learned fellow, recruited to serve the Tremaines as part of the Gaunt Dowry, greets the Tremaines' unexpected return and informs them of the gods awaiting to know the date of Tyler's wedding to the Lord Windle Gaunt. As with most things, the Lord Aster puts it off to deal with later. A reunion between siblings promptly occurs as the Bywater Bastard, Jamie Waters, finds his sister, the Lady Allegra Dorsey, settling back in at Famine's Hold. Seven years Allegra has been gone, Seven years of change, civil war. Jamie and Aster on opposite sides. Redgrass Field, death. Much is different. Allegra's a mother now. Her direct children all staying back at Tidesdorp, the ancestral seat of House Dorsey, with her father, the Lord Yonis. She is here with her gentle stepdaughter, Danella who she is begrudgingly trying to find a husband for. The two eldest surviving children of House Tremaine, but not in charge, muse about how it all went wrong and are now strangers in their childhood home. As this reunion occurs, Tala makes her way to the stables to breathe free for what feels like the first time in ages. There she goes to see her fiery-tempered stallion, Relore, <laughs> the devil's own steed, as impressive as he is onerous. Against the stable master Bryce's soft objection, Tyler saddles up and goes for a dusk ride. Later, Aster visits his older sister and meets her prized and loyal Borzoi, Clay, the loyal hound of gift from her husband. Tense words are exchanged over Tyler's betrothal. Allegra believes she can break a crown marriage with little to no consequence. Aster stresses a need for discretion and caution. Words received as an ill wind by the Lady Dorsey, who still sees Aster as a foolish younger sibling, instead of a lord with few prospects, fewer allies, and haunted by war. Anyway, Adeline Tremaine, mistress of arms for the house, huntress of the Crown Hills, Famine Sting, cousin to the Lord Aster and his line, spies Tala speeding across the fields on her law and decides to try and catch up to her. The two meet at the river on the edge of Redgrass Field. There they dismount and in the last light of dusk discuss Tala's patrol. Crown marriages are rarely a joyous affair for anyone but those on the very edges of it. The arrangements are tense and often, as it is the case here, a poor match. Good masters, Diplomacy is an art, not a science. Art takes passion, skill, and forethought. Too often, those in power see only the end goal with no consideration to the actions taken to get there. Contemptible complacency, a recipe for ruin. The two Tremaine cousins muse on the desire for simpler lives and the bleak worries tied to being forced to marry a possible hostile stranger. Then... As an errant wish is made by the young Tala for a life worthy of song and adventure, a shooting star skirts with haste across the sky. Before you all chuckle, keep this in mind. Before dragons darkened the skies, celestial portents shaped the fates of kingdoms. Waiting in the stables for Lady Tala's return, Aster discusses the shower of silver with Bryce. This opens the hurt of family dead for backing Blackfire. 
the young lord is defeatedly cross at the folly of it all and the mess he has inherited. The elder stable master, fond of the previous head of house, states it was more misfortune than a bad choice. The ladies Tremaine return, and soon it is Aster and Tyler alone together. They head up to the hayloft like kids, and confer. Tyler admits to wanting to escape Gonscrip, her bashful fondness for the Lord Diffin Valerian, and wanting to keep a life at Famine's Hold. Aster pleads caution, his words starting to make an impact but not sealing any deal. They finish together with frivolity, leaping from the loft to a hay pile below. As the two youngest remain speak honestly to each other, the two eldest whine and converse with the Lord Valerian. A hunt for the near future is decided upon. It's a better means to show his lordship more of the mainland. Driftmark Isle is lovely, but its stony shores are another world compared to the rolling fields of the Crownlands. The next day, Maester Horace has words with the Lord Astor in preparation for guests and hosting the hunt. It is noted in the journal of steward Valen Manx that Maester Horace was a man preoccupied with manners, protocol, and appearance. A poor match for House Tremaine, and a worse in particular for the Lord Astor. But what would one expect of a gift from one's ancestral enemy? Allegra goes and finds the Lady Tyler. While Allegra wants to discuss worming out of the crown marriage, Tyler speaks fondly of the, the fabled men and romances of Dawn, of Allegra's development of a mother's voice and does her best to put all thought of the gaunts behind her. But Allegra refuses to be swayed from talking about anything else but breaking the betrothal. The Lady Allegra, taking after her mother-in-law, the Tempest of Crackclaw Point, Marguerite Dorsey. A woman so notoriously onerous, brigands and ne'er-do-wells fled her lands, rather than risk running afoul of her or her walking stick. Bowbreaker, which, in truth, was a castle-forged short pole hammer she received as a wedding gift from her husband. But I digress. Jaehaerys Targaryen, the Bywater Bastard, better known as Jamie Waters, speaks with Bryce about prey options for the upcoming hunt when the Lord Aster strolls in. The two half-siblings decide upon hunting a wrangle of deer before Aster bumbles about asking for aid with Allegra, the Lord Diffin, the Lord's Will, the young man who should have never been left to hold a house, entreating the one who should have held the title. Oh, but for the foolish discretion of lords and more foolish actions when staring the stranger in the face. A discussion for another time. Maester Horace delivers a missive bearing the seal of House Gaunt to Adeline, it warns that the Gaunts are somehow aware of the hunt, and warn Adeline in particular not to be present. It is signed mysteriously with a lone letter, D. A flustered Adeline crumples the note and finds Aster and informs him of the missive. Aster tries to reassure Adeline that everything will be well. Adeline is cagey about the letter's author. The Lord Tremaine fails to do anything but cave to Adeline's demands. In the hall, the Lord Diffin nearly collides with Aster. The two lords exchange pleasantries when Diffin confesses to hearing sounds that reminded him of roaring seas while lying awake the previous night. Aster dismisses it as wind blowing by Famine's Hold and leaves the bewildered Lord Valerian to wander about the castle. Meanwhile, Jamie Waters sets about putting right what Aster could and would not by confronting Allegra about her meddling. Harsh words are exchanged as they walk the grounds just outside the hold. Bob's years in their making. In the end, Allegra agrees to stop pressing about the crown marriage, just as the odd sound of stone grinding against stone echoes through the walls of the castle. But the peculiarities of Famine's Hold and its architecture are for another time. I strongly suggest reading up on the history of House Will. In particular, The Adders of Dawn by Dulcia Sand. The romanticism contained therein belies a deep and accomplished understanding of motivations and historical detail. 
for including appendices alone is worth its own lecture, but I'll leave that to Maester Hollock. Now I leave you, good masters, to your studies.'